So up next we have Maurizio Villamizar Villegar, I hope I pronounced that correctly, all the way from the Central Bank of Colombia. And um, this will be the last presentation on our workshop on new data, new models and new methods. And um, so to finish that off and tie everything together, no one better. So over to you Maurizio, can you hear us? Yes, I, I can hear you perfect. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Thank you. And uh, for thank us. you for having me here, of course. Um, so I, I have uh, downtown Bogota in the background, just in case uh, you know you guys don't uh, haven't been to Colombia yet. And then the central bank would be somewhere around here. Um, so that's uh, our headquarters, uh, in okay. case anyone wants to visit. Uh, let me let me just try to share uh, the screen uh, before I start. Looks like summer. <laughs> right, so, so let me just uh, get a confirmation if you can hear the uh, presentation um, and if you can hear me well. Yes, well, that's good. Thank you. All right, perfect. Uh, well, so I was initially asked by Nicola to uh, <clears throat> to present one of my papers with uh, Hyun Sung Shin and Boris Hoffman about the effects of uh, foreign exchange intervention on domestic credit and capital flows. Uh, but being uh, you know disruptive uh, as I am, you know Colombians and Italians are like that. You can ask uh, Nicola and can confirm. Uh, I insisted instead on talking about where uh, this large literature is is heading and on what's new in terms of data methods and models. So I will touch base on some of my papers, but not to the extent of a formal uh, academic presentation. Uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the overall context, you know, the corner or bipolar uh, hypotheses that postulates that countries are moving away from intermediate regimes towards either uh, hard pegs or fully flexible uh, exchange rates began to lose popularity after the East Asia crisis in the 90s and the failure of Argentina's currency board uh, at the beginning of the new millennium. Uh, since then, since then uh, many central banks uh, have wanted to have uh, monetary policy autonomy, but many have been reluctant to relinquish control over the value of their currencies. In fact, you know, for developed economies, you have large concerted initiatives such as the Smithsonian uh, Agreement, the Plaza and Louvre Accords, the Chiang Mai Initiative and the Pittsburgh Agreement, among others. Uh, for emerging market economies, you have even more frequent and wider uh, interventions, but in less uh, coordinated fashion. So for example, of the 19 central banks that respond to the BIS questionnaire, uh, a third of them uh, say that they intervene uh, at a regular basis on more than 50% of working days. So this has led, uh, you know, people like uh, authors like Calvo and Reinhardt and Neely to say that, you know, emerging markets intervene so frequent uh, in the exchange rate market to the extent of becoming an empirical uh, regularity. Um, so this is a, a figure that I wanted to show you from one of our papers with some colleagues at the Central Bank with uh, Lucia Arango and Daniela Rodriguez, as well as with uh, Lucas Menkoff, uh, that shows about 20 countries uh, with announced or secret intervention. So you can see, for example, there that for Africa, we document Malawi, Zambia, and Uganda. Uh, the US is left uh, white because it's the benchmark case. Um, and there are obviously more countries with uh, foreign exchange intervention, but keep in mind that in this paper, we only surveyed, uh, you know, studies that explicitly mention foreign exchange intervention in the abstract of the title, and only on countries that intervene uh, with US dollars. Uh, so again, here you can see the same information, but now by number of works by country and by decade. So we see a lot of papers on foreign exchange intervention during the 90s and the 2000s. Um, and, I, and I do think that the attention is again increasing. Uh, so I'm basing this on, on recent work by the IMF and the BIS. So I would forecast uh, a big number of works uh, for the next decade. 
uh, you know, there are obviously, you know, some restrictions uh, on the effectiveness of foreign exchange intervention. There's uh, some obstacles uh, include, for example, in the theoretical grounds, uh, you know, the impossible trinity or trilemma uh, indicates that a country cannot simultaneously allow for free capital flows, have autonomous monetary policy, and adopt a, a fixed or managed exchange rate due to arbitrage by foreign investors. So in this sense, policymakers can only gain control of the exchange rate if they either abandon monetary policy or enact capital controls. And what I mean by monetary policy autonomy is being able to set interest rates freely, of course. On the empirical front, uh, isolating the effects of uh, intervention is empirically challenging. Uh, you, on the first hand, you have uh, measurement error, uh, and this is due to the fact that data is scarce and mostly proprietary in this literature. And many studies proxy uh, interventions with changes in international reserves, even at the risk of capturing confounding factors, uh, for example, valuation effects. You also have a simultaneity bias in which uh, central banks respond to economic conditions. And of course, the economy is effective. If, if interventions are effective, the economy responds to central bank actions. And then you have the, uh, uh, you know, the standard uh, omitted variable bias uh, in which it's difficult to pinpoint the relevant information that monetary authorities used uh, when setting their policy decisions, especially, especially with a, a very clear uh, timing profile. So having good data can help with the first two problems, but only a convincing identification strategy can help with the third. Now, if you were to, if you were to plot Countries ac according to the trilemma indices, as uh, has appeared in Eisenman and Ito. Uh, so, for example, in this figure, you have financial openness on the y axis and monetary independence in the x axis. Then the trilemma would be constrained to the top right quadrant. And this is basically uh, what you see in empirical studies, where that studies that are in the top right quadrant only report. Uh, you know, 26% of, uh, of effectiveness, of central bank effectiveness when intervening in the foreign exchange market, while the other quadrants uh, basically double uh, that amount. So it is basically uh, no surprise that to this date, there is a general uh, lack of consensus on the effects of foreign exchange intervention. Um, so I've listed here five surveys. Uh, the last work is actually a meta-analysis, uh, but they all have one thing in common. And what they all show is that slightly over half of studies find significant results. So let me, let me move on uh, to the first uh, you know, part uh, of the presentation, which is the data. I'll, I'll just comment very briefly on this part. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll just say a few words on, on the sources and the type of uh, data that, that's out there. So first, uh, you would have you know, the very low frequency macroeconomically oriented studies uh, that use you know, uh, basically you know, VARs in this literature mostly or, or panels, uh, country panels, and that basically do uh, proxy foreign exchange interventions with changes in, in international reserves. And they bank on the idea that uh, foreign, ex uh, foreign exchange uh, reserve accumulation has surged uh, from 5% of GDP to almost 30% in, uh, in GDP over the past uh, three decades. The, the problem here again, uh, or the caveat here is that you know countries can accumulate reserves for a variety of reasons, not just to intervene in the foreign exchange market. When moving on to more frequent data, uh, there are, uh, you know, I see two basically options of, uh, of moving forward. The first is to see, uh, you know, data that's out there already by, by published work. So, for example, my friend uh, uh, Lukas Menkov uh, has a paper with, uh, with Lucio Sarno and Frazier that uh, uh, published data for 33 countries at a daily uh, frequency, but again, only, only and mostly. Uh, on advanced economies during uh, 1995 to 2011. Uh, other than that, you can you can actually go to other uh, data sources. Uh, of course, you have the uh, you know usual candidates. You have the uh, Fed, uh, the BIS, the IMF, and if you are patient enough, 
uh, and fluent in other countries, or at least you have a very good translator, uh, you know, you can go ahead and, and visit the individual central bank websites. Although I do recommend at least going there with a local uh, to learn a, a little bit about all these uh, specific contextual characteristics uh, that may that may arise, which which you know they will. <laughs> so moving on to the um, different types of data, of course, you have uh, you know data uh, relating uh, or around market conditions and around the um, monetary trilemma. So for example, you might be interested in the uh, different exchange rate regimes there. <clears throat> there's a paper by Itzelski uh, in 2019 that publishes uh, fine and coarse uh, regimes. So countries categorized by regimes uh, at a yearly frequency. Uh, you can have trilemma measures, as I showed before. Uh, capital controls are, of course, very interesting uh, to analyze and to see if they, uh, in fact, uh, magnify the effects of foreign exchange intervention. And then you have currency crisis and banking crisis that you can also download from uh, uh, La Vena and Valencia as uh, a paper. Now, those are, those are interesting uh, around the way interventions happen. Uh, regarding the way in which interventions are conducted, uh, you know, you, you might want to check out, uh, you know, if interventions are secret or announced, uh, discretionary or rule-based. And then, um, you know, you might want to focus on the different mechanisms uh, of, of the trades themselves. So, for example, if they happen through auctions, trades in the spot market, derivatives, uh, in, the, in the, you know, recent pandemic, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of countries, a lot of emerging market economies intervene with derivatives. So, for example, FX swaps uh, with uh, repurchasing agreements uh, denoted in U.S. dollars, which is uh, relatively new. And then uh, non-deliverable forwards as well. So I've listed there a couple of, uh, a few countries that have implemented these policies. Um, so that's, uh, that's basically what I had to say in terms of data. Uh, moving on to the methods. Uh, section where the core issue here is to identify enough exogenous variation uh, in order to identify causal effects. So in the vast majority of cases, um, a, a central bank reaction function uh, is estimated in order to keep the uh, uh, estimated residuals as, as policy shocks, right? as, as some people call it, as unconventional policy shocks, which are foreign exchange intervention shocks. And here, most of the literature employs uh, discrete choice models, such as program logits. Uh, so this implicitly, this, this would suggest the existence of a, some external factor that prevents monetary authorities to symmetrically re react to economic conditions. So in essence, some sort of fear of floating uh, or fear of appreciation as coined by Calvo and Reinhardt. Uh, again, the, the main drawback here is that, uh, you know, these models obviously rely on heavily dependent uh, parametric assumptions uh, and, and, and a lot of structure about the, uh, about the economy. Now, there, there have been a, a handful of papers that base their identification on a quasi-experimental uh, framework. Uh, some have used, uh, you know, propensity score matching techniques, while others have used uh, regression discontinuity designs. Regarding the latter, uh, you know, rule-based uh, interventions uh, have the, you know, the main advantage that the rule by which interventions are triggered is known. So uncertainty uh, is only relating to the question of whether the rule was triggered or not, and not on what the rule is. Uh, so that's one of the big advantages, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, you know, one paper with uh, Guido Kirsteiner from uh, the University of Maryland and, and David Phillips from, from uh, Notre Dame uh, that is published in, J in JIE. Uh, so I'll, I'll take a couple of slides just to talk a little bit about this paper. Um, so here, uh, again, we looked at the Colombian case uh, when, where one particular intervention was uh, triggered whenever the exchange rate with respect to its monthly average, exceeded a given threshold, uh, which was typically set at 4%. And that's basically what you see in the figure. So the left panel shows the peso uh, dollar exchange rate and the cutoff band. And then the right panel shows the triggering uh, FX options. So put options if uh, they're below the band and call options if above the band. 
And notice that in this setting, the assignment of treatment is completely determined by a cutoff rule uh, based on a continuous uh, running variable xt, xt again here being the exchange rate with respect to its monthly average. So essentially, uh, we compare uh, episodes in which the rule was barely triggered with episodes in which the rule barely missed the cutoff. And, and intuitively, you know, the rule creates a, natu a natural experiment when in close uh, proximity of the cutoff point. Uh, so to illustrate this further, uh, you know, if you consider a simple, you know, linear regression model, where in the case of foreign exchange intervention, you know, you would mostly likely have a significant bias if you were to use OLS. And the reason is that, the reason is that interventions, uh, so DT, uh, systematically responds to economic conditions that also affect the exchange rate. However, in, a, in this localized approach, small variations in the running variable uh, lead to small variations in the error term, which in turn generate a discontinuous jump in D in treatment. And it is precisely this variation that uh, a regression uh, discontinuity design, design exploits uh, in order to conduct causal inference. So finally, let me, let me show you this uh, table, which doesn't show the main results of the paper, but what it does show is, or at least exemplifies the identification strategy, which I was just talking about. So this table just shows a regression of the intervention dummy on some selected macro fundamentals. And what you see is that in the first two columns uh, that cover the entire sample, you see some economic factors that have a significant effect on intervention. However, as the bandwidth narrows, uh, exchange rate variation becomes uncoupled from economic factors. And in the limit, observations behave as good as randomly assigned around the cutoff rule. At least that's, that's, that's what you want. Um, so moving on to the final part of my presentation, which I now think I'm gonna take uh, about only half an hour, and then we can just uh, open up for discussions if uh, Nicola is okay with this. Um, you know, in this, in this, um, in the in the overall foreign exchange intervention literature, uh, you have two main channels uh, potentially at work. Uh, so you have the portfolio balance channel, where agents care about the mix of different currency denominated assets. So here, assets are imperfect substitutes. Uh, and here, you know, the literature began basically with uh, authors such as Henderson and Rogoff, Corey, Branson and Henderson. Uh, there's a, a, an influential paper by Gavax and, uh, and Majori. Uh, I believe uh, Matteo presented a couple of days in this conference. Um, I've also listed the microstructure approach uh, within the portfolio balance channel. So some authors actually take the microstructure approach as a different channel. But ultimately, uh, you know, the microstructure approach uh, also assumes that assets are imperfect substitutes, and that's the reason why interventions are effective uh, at all. So even even if this approach is based more on the idea that you know private information is dissipated, uh, you know, slowly or fast across prices, uh, I, I believe that it's still uh, part of the portfolio balance channel, and then. The other main channel is a signaling channel, which conveys uh, information regarding the future stance of uh, monetary policy. So I will um, briefly cover uh, just two of my papers uh, under the portfolio channel. Uh, let me, well, the first one uh, is a joint work with Hernando Vargas, who's the uh, deputy governor of the Central Bank of Colombia and also my boss. So let me uh, describe, you know, very briefly the main features uh, here. Uh, so we, fo we focus on a short time period where output and prices are taken as given. The uncovered interest rate parity will fail uh, due to risk averse speculators who bet on the currency using the forward market. So those are gonna be the first type of agents. And by assumption, we allow the covered interest rate parity to hold, which allows banks, who are gonna be our, our second type of agents, to arbitrage uh, interest rate differentials. Now, I'm, not, I'm not sure how banks in South Africa uh, operate, 
but banks in many emerging economies, including Colombia, choose not to have uh, open net foreign exchange positions. So for example, a shift in banks forward position is matched exactly by an opposite shift in their spot position, right? So if they sell forwards, then they buy uh, dollars in the spot market. And what we find uh, in this paper is that, uh, you know, when market uncertainty is low, foreign exchange intervention is less effective for uh, agents are willing to bet more money against the central bank. And conversely, when uh, uncertainty is high, then foreign exchange intervention is more effective uh, for the central bank will face a weaker countervailing force uh, from speculators and arbitragers. So let me, let me just try to convince you over the next two slides of, uh, of this conclusion uh, of these results. Uh, so again, you know, the setup is very simple. You have a uh, net supply of dollars that uh, has two components, one that depends positively on the exchange rate and one exogenous component, which you can think of as the uh, autonomous part of the current account. So capital flows do not respond to the exchange rate, right? You also have the covered interest rate parity. Now, speculators maximize their expected utility where capital F is the amount of forward sales. Uh, so they can make money selling forwards as long as the forward price is greater than the future exchange rate. Um, so the problem here obviously is that the future exchange rate is, is unknown. So, you know, by assuming uh, a constant absolute uh, risk aversion utility functions and some standard normality assumptions, you know, the speculators problem can be stated as a mean variance uh, optimization model uh, where the first order conditions uh, tells us that uh, forward, net forward sales depends uh, negatively on risk aversion lambda and on the speculators uh, variance uh, sigma. And then the equilibrium condition is simply when total supply uh, equals total demand uh, in the spot market. Uh, and this basically total demand just follows from the first order condition and the covered interest rate parity. Um, and then taking the equilibrium condition and differentiating it with respect to the exchange rate uh, yields uh, the following partial derivatives. So the first, so the, the second bullet point, which is the first der uh, partial derivative states that sales of dollars uh, appreciate the exchange rate. Uh, and that, that's basically more by design. Again, so this follows directly from the fact that the, uh, from, from, from the, fact that the uncovered interest rate parity is violated. Uh, more interestingly, the second uh, partial derivative says that this relationship is amplified uh, with a higher degree of market uncertainty. So if you see graphically, so here uh, in the graph, you have the exchange rate on the uh, x-axis. So movements to the right, means uh, that the peso is depreciating. So again, here uh, we have uh, pesos over dollar. Um, and then you have the amount on the y-axis. So graphically, the slope of the demand curve uh, will depend on the variance of the exchange rate. Uh, so, so it's gonna be very flat for high uncertainty. Uh, whenever a central bank sells dollars, the supply shrinks and the effect on the exchange rate is going to be higher for cases with greater uncertainty. Um, so under, under risk neutrality, if we were not uh, assuming uh, care utility functions for, uh, for speculators, then the uncovered interest rate parity would, would hold. And then graphically, you would see the demand curve uh, completely elastic appearing here as a, as a vertical uh, line. Um, so that's one of the papers that I just wanted to discuss. Uh, I will only offer some minor insights of, uh, of our paper with uh, Hyun Sung Shin and Boris, uh, which you know, essentially shows that currency appreciation uh, reduces uh, tail risks uh, when banks have diversified uh, loan portfolios, thereby increasing their loan supply. So in this sense, 
uh, foreign exchange purchases have attributes or potential attributes of leaning against credit booms. Um, in this in this paper, we assume obviously that borrowers have a debt of uh, of one dollar and experience valuation effects of exchange rate movements. Uh, so in this paper, theta is going to be the exchange rate, but it's going to be defined uh, opposite to the previous paper. So here we're having dollars over pesos. So here a higher theta indicates a stronger peso. Uh, and just to list some, some ingredients, um, you know, the model has entrepreneurs and banks. Uh, the total risk is going to be a function of the common risk factor and some idiosyncratic risks uh, that each borrower faces. Uh, borrowers default when the, their uh, realization of their project is less than its uh, notional debt. And then the bank allocates equity capital for, bond, for bonds and loans. Uh, so let me just uh, list, list some of the propositions of, in the paper. Um, so the first one, for example, says that the cumulative uh, distribution function of the bank's uh, loan portfolio is lower when the peso is stronger. Uh, so intuitively, the you know, banks can diversify away idiosyncratic default risk for individual borrowers, but they cannot fully diversify away the tail risk due to the common component. Uh, so here, when a peso, so a peso appreciation reduces individual borrower, borrower's default and also reduces uh, tail risk. So, so again, you know, think of this model, you know, in, in, in its simplest terms as an optimal portfolio model with a binding value at risk constraint. When the, when the dollar is strong, then, you know, that's bad news for firms and people that have loans in dollars, right? So that's similar to my case uh, when I acquired my college uh, loans in dollars. And then, you know, the, the peso depreciated and I had to work, uh, you know, twice as hard to pay that. Uh, and the fact that more people will default will make uh, banks uh, lend less, uh, even in domestic currency. Uh, so that's basically what's captured in the uh, second uh, proposition that states that the you know, leverage of the loan unit, uh, lambda, uh, increases when the peso appreciates. So lambda here being an increasing function of theta, of the exchange rate theta. Uh, you know, so skipping over you know, technicalities, you know, for any given level of capital, uh, a depreciation of the peso translates into a decrease in total lending. And, and this has to do with the value at risk constraint operating. Um, and then, you know, the proposition three basically, again, says that not only uh, to total lending is, uh, you know, decreases, but also uh, lending in uh, local currency is also decreases, right? So, so again, this is this is uh, just basically uh, taking the identity of the fact that uh, total capital of the bank, which is capital E, is distributed amongst, uh, you know, is used for a bond unit uh, and a loan unit. So, so th those were basically just uh, some of the, you know, main findings of the paper that I wanted to highlight. Um, I don't know, Nicola. I think I took half the time that I was allotted, but uh, but I think that we can uh, maybe just uh, discuss. Nice uh, <laughs> no, actually, it's very is is one of the pithy of uh, of this online uh, word that we cannot because we had the paper before. Uh, looking at South Africa and about the um, which to, to try to model uh, this non uh, uh, UIP structure, uh, therefore non UIP uh, exchange rate. This uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 financial, yeah? therefore the effect of uh, having to finance in our globalistic uh, model. And therefore, it's interesting. It's interesting also because we need to really to ourselves to understand if we start to think of in this direction, and that really we need to think about the foreign exchange market as this uh, uh, place for speculators, is how do we model it and uh, 
how do we do we think uh, the transmission mechanism is uh, therefore what is the transmission mechanism from the exchange rate to to the economy and this is some of the stuff that you are uh, you are point their point yeah, you are pointed out and in particular there is always this uh, it comes out sort of uh, uh, always the, this result this result of the dependency on the volatility or one end the dependency of the volatility on the risk the, the ability of the of the speculators to absorb risk therefore more high, higher is volatility more higher is the risk and more you have this volatility exchange rate and then uh, it's quite normal to say okay if i can because this one is a sort of if you want auto equilibrium volatility uh, it come natural to say intervention then uh, because eliminate these uh, uh, spikes if you want is reduce also the transmission of these to the economy but then the question is what is the best instrument to do that is intervention in because then you have uh, you have both in the model the banking system and then the fact of the banking system to the economy overall and therefore the question we are we are uh, discussing is right at which level uh, the policy intervention is more uh, efficient at the level of intervention in the foreign market, at the level of uh, macroprudential policies, therefore directly on the uh, on the banking system, or at the level of, uh, for example, in the last example, on the firm balance sheet directly, for the ability of the firm to borrow in foreign currency, for example. Before I was curious to understand also how through this, uh, this uh, you know, long uh, work that you do in, the, in this area, really what is the thinking around this issue in a place like Colombia that, uh, that obviously also, yeah, I mean, that, that clearly is uh, thinking a lot about these things. No, that, that's, uh, those, those are you know, key points, uh, Nicola, and, and if I may, let me, let me just uh, say just a few comments. Uh, uh, just to to get the uh, discussion going. So so the first, you know, I I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think, you know, the first the first thing the first question that that should come up, uh, you know, for active practitioners here in this literature is, you know, uh, how many how many degrees of freedom does the central bank have? And and I think this question, you know, which is obvious, is, is sometimes overlooked. And and I think that some central banks think that you know they can just you know, throw everything uh, there to, you know, to stop or to change the market, uh, you know, without, without actually uh, at least, uh, you know, detailing that or, or having into account that some policies can actually offset other policies as well. And, and, and you know, in, in the first few slides of, the, uh, of my presentation, you know, I was saying, you know, some banks actually do, uh, are, are maybe a little bit over ambitious um, in the sense that they want to have you know, control over the exchange rate, uh, e you know, either on some sort of level or at least, uh, you know, some volatility measure, some, some moment of the exchange rate. They also want to, uh, you know, this, they, they, they want to have uh, inflation under control, right? So they're inflation targeters. Um, and, then, and then they also want to have, uh, you know, uh, capital flows uh, freely into and out of the country. And, and sometimes, you know, it's just not possible to have all of these. So, you know, having, having some leeway in some uh, instruments can really sacrifice the effectiveness of other policies. So, so you know, there's, there's an, a nice paper um, uh, recently by the IMF that shows, uh, you know, this integrated uh, policy framework that throws, uh, you know, uh, macro prudential policies, uh, policies, you know, with, you know, interest rate uh, policies and then exchange rate policies. And in, in some way, at least they hint on, 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 you know, depending on the economy and depending on the state, on, on different states of the economy, some actually might be more effective than others. So, I, I mean, I think that's, that's, you know, one of those, you know, key issues that, you know, any central banker must have, you know, when deciding, you know, you know, there's there's obviously this trade-off, and 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 it's not always looked in in a you know in, in a manner that you know in the attention that it deserves, uh, if I if I may, um, you know in at, at the central bank, you know you can you can maybe say something about this, Nicola, uh, at least about the the South African case, 
in, in the Central Bank of Colombia, uh, you know, we've been asking ourselves, you know, a bunch of questions regarding, you know, foreign exchange intervention. One of them is, you know, the duration of, of effects, you know, if, if they're effective, obviously, but then if they are, you know, how long do they last? So, so you know, I was wondering if, if South Africa shares, you know, this, uh, you know, concern, uh, given that, you know, in some way, South Africa and Colombia are, are pretty similar, uh, at least in, in, uh, in the context of monetary policy. And, and then the other thing is, you know, the, um, the main mechanism of this, you know, portfolio bans literature that you mentioned operates obviously through the risk premium. And, and this is something that's been explored uh, and that's still being explored. Uh, there's there's a, a paper by, uh, by Sebnem at the University of Maryland that, you know, also tries to characterize, you know, this risk premium uh, in terms of uh, how volatile, you know, the world is and how volatile uh, that specific countries uh, are. So, you know, I, th I think those are interesting fronts. Um, I don't know if Nikolai, you know, what, what, what would be your take on, on all these things? I don't know if any from the from the actual bank who want to say something on this. <laughs> I don't want to talk for them otherwise. <laughs> no, I think they, they just like they, they, nobody has raised their hands just yet. They cannot talk about the exchange rate. That's the rule. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. No, because because the uh, the issue here has always been uh, actually to avoid intervention yeah? for that the bank that is that is have chosen a sort of uh, a very flexible exchange rate uh, not to intervene on the exchange rate because those are coming from experience of being burned quite a lot by uh, by uh, exchange rate intervention uh, uh, in, at the beginning of the 90s uh, in the 90s. Therefore, the, the policy is not to, to intervene. Obviously, this will become very difficult in moments like the one we experienced in the last 10 years in which we have a lot of external shocks. A very large external shock, and given also the, the nature of monetary policy in the developed economy, the nature of, uh, uh, of the volatility they, they, that this generate, the, the bubble in bond market and et cetera, that this one obviously Put a lot of uh, volatility on the exchange, was a lot of volatility on the exchange rate, and therefore then you open a discussion. How do we understand this? And what is the effect? And I think it's important to understand also what is the effect of try to control the volatility. Eh? Which I, how do we identify, if you want, the, what you were discussing, uh, the identification problem that we have in in uh, in a var or in a model to really to identify what are you know intervention sort of exogenous intervention from uh, from just a, 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 a policy reaction to some other development in the economy. Therefore, I, I, this one also, uh, um, what is the, what is the, uh, the thinking, the analysis around what is the role of this intervention in the, in the forum? If you have any, uh, any view on what is the cost relative to the, the benefit, and is this link? Because one thing about the last paper was uh, uh, the last paper we were describing it was interesting is because we always talk about the intervention in terms of fear of floating and dollarization of uh, private sector or, or balance sheet. But how much is dependent on that? On the specific characteristic of the of, uh, of the dollarization of, uh, uh, of of the liabilities of the of the private sector, and how much instead is uh, general? I mean, a general uh, effect of volatility on uncertainty and uncertainty and investment. That is more what here people are worrying about. Absolutely, uh, Nicola. I mean, in the in the um, what what motivated the last uh, the last paper with Hewn and Boris uh, was was precisely that. I mean, we you know we we were thinking that 
you know, all these, all these papers were looking at the effects of, of intervention, of foreign exchange intervention on the exchange rate. And, and, and that was it. I mean, that was, that was the end goal. And we were thinking that maybe, uh, you know, the foreign exchange intervention could actually affect, you know, maybe more than that. And that's where, where you know, when we started looking at, uh, you know, the financial sector and, and banks balances. So, you know, I think, I think, you know, there are, you know, we were, we weren't obviously the, the only ones looking into this, but, you know, people who were, were at least asking questions of, uh, you know, can foreign exchange intervention have an impact on capital flows? Can they deter or, or attract uh, capital flows or, you know, more precisely and, and more related to our paper, uh, you know, do they have a, any impact on lending, right? Uh, on firms lending. And then, and then obviously, you know, you would, what, what, what we started doing was to analyze, uh, you know, the loan, the credit market. So using, you know, the, the entire credit registry, we started seeing, uh, you know, for the corporate credit registry, we started seeing what kind of firms had uh, debt in dollars and, you know, if they were covered at, until a certain point or not, uh, you know, with, with exchange rate forwards or something like that. And then, and then what, what happens to those firms uh, under, you know, depreciating uh, episodes? Uh, and that's, that's uh, sort of uh, become, you know, uh, that's been studied more over, over time, I think. And it's been incorporated into some, uh, you know, stress testing of central banks to see, you know, let's, let's uh, suppose the exchange rate depreciates by 20%. You know, how, how bad is this thing? I mean, is this going to bust so many firms uh, that, you know, importing firms, uh, you know, what's going to happen to all, all these loans that are in dollars? Uh, you know, the example there was, I mean, I don't know if, if it was your case, uh, Nicola, when you went to study abroad, but when I, when I went, I went to study, you know, I, my, all my loans were in dollars and then, you know, the exchange rate doubled. Uh, so I had to pay twice the amount that I, that I had initially um, left with. <laughs> so that, that was, you know, something of a motivation to study this. So. No, yeah, yeah. I had to stay in Europe. I was protected by uh, the European uh, <laughs> welfare state that helped me to go through. <laughs> but the benefits of the, of the euro. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the euro was very important at the time, yes. No, exactly. Uh, the four, yeah, you, you work then on, on uh, with credit registry just to, to, to analyze the effect on the, of these own firms. Right, right. So on the on, on that paper, right. So we, we do, I mean, we, we do some, uh, you know, intrinsic data work where we match, uh, you know, the data. Uh, so, this, so this is something, I mean, that one, one good thing about uh, Colombia is the data, uh, I think, at least, you know, compared to other Latin American countries. Uh, so here, what we do is we match the entire corporate credit registry with the uh, corporate registry so in that case we see every loan uh, loan by loan to every firm but but then we also see each firm and its yearly balances uh, so that that really allows for for a lot uh, you know to do a lot a lot with that um, so you know I you know recently again talking uh, you know with some people from the uh, MBR uh, you know Pierre Olivier uh, Gorinchas and, and uh, you know and Christina uh, Arellano and, and Sebnem, you know, they were, they were all very interested in, in really trying to, uh, you know, explore, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, features coming from that data, from that matching. I see that that matching is, uh, yeah, is, is rich. Uh, because actually is, is the, the final question is that, is how these affect credit also if you look at this literature you know this this transmission through the banking to the banking to the firm and the real activity is really where the uh, there is also the worry about intervening uh, what has the effect that has got on the overall uh, on the overall balance therefore you know because the issue of here is why okay why worry about volatility if, if uh, you can uh, how do you say, uh, insure against the volatility. Uh, if you know that you have a lot of volatility, 
you can essentially the companies, especially when you have uh, a lot of mining companies, etc., they should be able to edge this kind of risk. Therefore, if the companies are able to edge, then the the need of intervention should be should, therefore is more you know is a private company need to have the technology to edge more than the need to use you know resources to control that right. and you know Colombia the same because it's a lot of mining companies as well that's 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 right Nicola I mean so so you know at, at least in the in the first part of the 2000s we we didn't have a very uh, developed uh, derivatives market so at least for that for those first 10 years it was it was difficult for a firm to hedge uh, their positions uh, or at least it was very costly uh, you know there, there was a huge uh, you know markup uh, on, on, on foreign exchange uh, forwards or options or things like that uh, after after 2010 uh, you know uh, the forwards market actually skyrocketed and now represent almost twice the size of the market of the spot uh, market uh, so I, I mean I think you're right the more the more you have access to these uh, instruments the less you have to fear about you know exchange rate movements there's there's obviously the the question here about you know the degree of, uh, of risk uh, aversion of uh, you know the people in the economy and if, if people are not very risk averse then even even if they do have these instruments at hand, they they won't they just simply won't uh, you know buy them, and they'll they'll just you know ride the risk, and and in those cases uh, you know some 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 of them can you know some bets can actually go bad. Uh, it's just like going to uh, Vegas for a weekend, and then uh, you know <laughs> maybe losing more than what you had. Yeah. <laughs> great. Anybody uh, intervene? I think they're all uh, yeah, I think... tired of the... <laughs> yeah. But it's, thank you very much, Maurice. It was uh, very nice. And we will Nicola, be... Nicola, no, my... I, I needed a picture of Pretoria and, uh, behind me. I need to find it so that <laughs> I can show you where the university is, where the bank is. But thank right, you very no, much. I mean, I, I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to definitely... Yes, uh, yes. You know, so I, I've, I've been to uh, South Africa. It's one of my favorite uh, countries. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. One of the most beautiful countries in the world. Okay. Uh, so, you know, when the pandemic is over, you know, please, yes. uh, you know... Okay, well, I'll come me, first in I'll, Bogota. I will go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're, always, you're, you're yeah. definitely invited.